the history of Jews or Poles or Germans or Latvians, whatever it might be, it can only ask questions. It can't answer them. It can ask, why did we suffer? It can ask, why were we perpetrators? It can ask, why did we collaborate? It can ask, why did we do nothing? And it's probably important that it asks those questions. But what it cannot do is answer those questions. The underlying basic fallacy of national history is that national forces are the forces that determine the world. If it's not our nation, it's someone else's nation. But this isn't true. There are things, there are things of a greater scale or of a more powerful nature at work in the world that go beyond the nations. And national history crowds those things out. Some of those things, um, economic, military, ideological factors, have to be taken into account. The second thing that I try to do is I try to avoid dialectics. What are dialectics? What do I mean by dialectics? Well, one example of dialectics is the way that the Soviets explained their own policies of mass killing. What did, what did Stalin or Kapanovich or Molotov say about their policies of mass killing in the 1930s? They said, we won the Second World War. And the implication is, sometimes made explicit, that all of that suffering, all of, this, all of those stark peasants, all of those hundreds of thousands of, of, of murdered peasants, because peasants suffered more than anyone else in the Soviet Union, all of those hundreds of thousands of murdered members of ethnic minorities, that was all necessary to winning the Second World War. Now, there's a very deep problem with this. There's a factual problem, which is that it didn't help, but that's not what concerns me. The, the underlying problem is that you can't write history that way. You can't explain why it is that the Soviet Union undertook a policy of mass starvation in Soviet Ukraine in 1933 by reference to events in 1945. One has to explain in the terms of the forces and the perceptions at work in 1933. The second thing that I mean by avoiding dialectics is that I don't try to explain each of the systems just in terms of the other. There's a very tempting way of looking at the world, which is to say that the Soviet Union was somehow just a reflection of Nazi Germany, or vice versa. And so in that sense, they just explain one another. I don't think that's the case. It's more complicated than that. There's another and related temp way of thinking of the world, which is that they cancel each other out. This one is much more widespread. The idea that when the Soviet Union liberated Eastern Europe, it somehow undid what the Germans had done. Unfortunately, that's not the case. Unfortunately, um, just because we code one of the systems as plus and the other as minus, or one, the first is minus, the second is plus, it doesn't actually come to zero. In real historical terms, what you have is an accumulation. It's very bad to be occupied by one of these powers. It is much worse in terms of your chances for surviving, whether you're Jewish or not, to be occupied by both of them. And in much of this land, there are actually three occupations. First the Soviets, then the Germans, and then the Soviets again. And in that zone of triple occupation, your chances of surviving, again, whether you're Jewish or not, um, is, is lower than anywhere else in the world at the time. So we might like to think of these systems in purely ideational terms, that, and the ideas somehow cancel each other out. But in the real world of territory society experience, uh, the policies of terror accumulate. To be very precise about this, the two systems interacted in ways which our nice categories about them don't really permit. Um, for example, we like to, when we talk about collaborators in the Holocaust, uh, as we do and as we should and as we must, one of the things that we tend not to understand is that the vast majority of collaborators in the Holocaust were citizens of the Soviet Union. So there was nothing about being a Soviet citizen which prevented you from taking part in the Holocaust. The people who did it um, in large measure were in fact citizens of the Soviet Union. A third metaphysic that I have to avoid in order to write this book is the metaphysic of, if you like, sanctification of saying that some events, and I mean above all the Holocaust, are so important, are so special, so unique, that we can extract them from history, that we can put them behind glass, that we can treat them as museum exhibitions as opposed to events. I think it's very important that this not be done. I think it's very important that especially, crucially important events such as the Holocaust remain precisely <coughs> in history. Because the moment one takes them out of history, not only does one abandon the chance of understanding them, 
One also gives the people who want them out of history for bad reasons advantages that they really ought not to have. The second thing that I do in this book, which is a little bit different from other books about these subjects, is that I focus on killing. Now, at first glance, that might not seem so unusual, but in fact, it, it is. The, the symbols of both German and Soviet terror are the camps, and understandably so. The camps were horrible institutions. Um, a couple of million people died in the German camps, a couple of million people died in the Gulag, roughly speaking. But the camps were not where people were sent to die. The camps were horrible institutions which took many, many lives, but they existed for both the Germans and the Soviets to punish, to correct, to extract labor. If the Germans or the Soviets wanted to kill you, um, they killed you usually very close to where you lived, and they used direct methods. Both regimes starved, and starvation was the, the method most widely used in the time and place. Both regimes shot, and the Germans gassed. The camps, horrible though they were, shroud the central reality of mass killing policies. Most Jews who died in the Holocaust, just to make this point as clear as I can, never saw a camp. They were gassed in facilities that were not camps, a camp you spend the night in, if you get off the train, you're immediately gassed. That's not a camp. Or they were shot very close to where they lived. The 14 million people that I'm talking about, for the most part, didn't have any contact with the concentration camp system at all. If you add the concentration camp system, you add, as I say, a few million victims. But you're not dealing with the central horror of the two regimes, which is my subject. The reason why this is worth stressing is that the camps leave behind a kind of record if you survive a camp, you can write about it. The places that I'm talking about very often had no survivors, or one survivor, or two survivors, or three survivors, or 50 survivors. For this reason, among others, they're much harder to reconstruct, but they really are the central, I think, issue. The final thing that I do in this book, which is different, but again, it will seem, so, it will seem the simplest thing in the world when I say it, is that I concentrate on place. If you read books about Hitler or books about Stalin or books about Hitler and Stalin, you see that these books suffer from what I think of as the jet lag problem. <coughs> Namely, chapter one is in Berlin, chapter two is in Moscow, chapter three is in Berlin, chapter four is in Moscow. You go back and forth and back and forth. What this doesn't allow one to see is where the killing actually took place, which is between Berlin and Moscow. By concentrating on this region, I'm able to keep in view the victims. And I'm also able to keep in view the regimes. Because the regimes were at their most deadly, precisely these, at, their, at their deadliest, precisely these places. And you can follow the records of the Soviet secret police, the NKVD, or the German Einsatzgruppen, from these places back to the center. And that gives you just as good or better an image of what was actually happening. I'm sorry? Oh, okay. Um, so this also means that I'm required to use, and I'm, I'm expected to use, I have to use sources, not, not just from Moscow and Berlin, but from the regions and from the peoples. Um, sources in the languages that these people spoke, which are Russian, Ukrainian, Yiddish, Polish, and so on. So once you have this place, what does it do to your explanation of the tragedy. How does place help? Let me try to illustrate this by way of reference to what I take would be our main explanation of these tragedies. I think in general, if I were to ask you, or anyone, why did the Nazis kill? Or why did the Stalinists kill? The answer would be something like ideology. They had the wrong ideas. They had bad ideas. Now, it's not that this explanation is wrong. It's, it's, it's right as far as it goes. But it begs the question of how these ideas became lethal. Because after all, ideas don't kill on their own. Um, ideology, and this is the first thing that place helps you to do, it helps you to see how ideology is incorporated by institutions of power, which it has to be. In the whole history of Jewish settlement in Europe, in Eastern Europe, every pogrom taken together, adding them all up, you get a total of deaths, which is equal to a day or two in October of 1942. 
What happens in the Holocaust is of a completely different order than anything which had happened in Jewish history before that. There was anti-Semitism throughout Eastern Europe, throughout this period, in some places more, in some places less. But it wasn't lethal without being, without being the state ideology of an important state, namely Nazi Germany, and also without that state fighting the war. You can say something similar about Marxism, right? Um, you know, there, there are presumably Marxists on this campus who haven't brought about the death of anyone. Um, Marxism, uh, presumably, um, <laughs> Mar <laughs> Marxism was the ideology of the city of Vienna in the 1920s uh, and early 1930s and led to nothing more threatening than swimming pools, communal apartments, and sex education. So Marxism as well has to be incorporated within Leninist institutions and in particular um, a Stalinist regime in order to be in order to be lethal. Now this point about ideology having to be incorporated in institutions is very important also for this question of collaboration. Because none of these murders can happen without hundreds of thousands of foot soldiers who do the actual killing. So it's important to see that collaboration is a phenomenon which has to be derivative of ideologies and institutions. Because Collaboration is not itself something people just do, right? Um, you know, no one who goes to college writes on their application essay, when I finish University of Memphis, I'm going to be a collaborator. Okay? It's, you don't look forward in your own life to collaborate with a foreign regime. It's something that happens when a foreign regime comes to where you live, then you collaborate, then most people do, in one way or another. Um, so the question of collaboration also leads us back to, this, to the issue of ideology and institutions. The second thing that we have to be able to understand is, is time. How ideology changes with time. And here you see something really interesting about the encounter between the Nazis and the Soviets. The, you know what's interesting about having these lights? You can see me, but I can't see you at all. It's really the strangest thing. Um, so if it, like, I'm trying to look you in the eyes, but I have no idea where I was see you. <laughs> so the, 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 the ideas of time Time within these ideologies are, are really interesting and important. So, ironically, for the Soviets, the, the revolution was in the past. My book is about the 30s and 40s. From that perspective, for the Soviets, the revolution is the Bolshevik Revolution of 1917, which they're trying to defend. From their point of view, their terror is defensive. Um, they're trying to modernize from within, they're trying to protect their, their, their system, their homeland and socialism from threats from without. And therefore, it's not surprising to learn that almost all Soviet killing happens inside the borders of the Soviet Union. And the Soviets are actually much more lethal during peacetime than they are during war. The Germans are another story. For the Germans, their revolution is in the future. Hitler comes to power in 1933, but he knows, that his, and Himmler knows, and Heydrich knows, and Goering knows, they all know that the things that they want to do to German society and the empire they want to create in Eastern Europe will only be possible after a triumphant war in the East. The war is going to permit the revolution. And so for most of the time the Nazis in power, they're looking ahead to this war. They're looking ahead to this revolution. The third thing which has to be clear, which has to be made clear about ideology, if we want place to explain ideology, or ideology to explain place, is that um, ideology always involves economics. I feel like this is a really pertinent point to be making during the Republican debates. Um, ideology always involves economics. And you know, anyone who tells you that their view of economics is ideologically neutral, you just have to you just ask who's paying them to say that. Um, ideology always involves economics. Now when I say that, I don't mean I don't mean a simple Marxist idea, like that someone's views are determined by their position in the order of production. But I mean that all important political ideologies contain within them a view of economic restructuring. So in the case of the Soviet Union, yes, Soviet ideology involves class war. Of course it's about class war. But class war in the name of modernizing the Soviet Union from within and making it an industrial power. Class war, which is to permit the control of agriculture and therefore the construction of, of, of industry, therefore the creation of powerful, well-funded state institutions. Yes, Hitlerian ideology is about race war. 
but it is about race war, which is meant to serve the creation of a vast agricultural colony in Eastern Europe. Um, an agricultural colony which will allow Germans to return to their proper racial essence, but which will also allow them to become self-sufficient economically. That's the idea. Now, these two ideas are very different. They're very different views of the future of economics. In the Soviet case, you're starting with a backward country, and you're trying to make it modern. In the German case, you're starting with the most modern country in the world, and you are, so to speak, trying to make it backward. That is, you're trying to add agricultural territories to an already industrially, industrially modern state. That's an intellectual contrast. Where does it come together? It comes together in territory. For both of these plans, the Soviet plan of modernization, the German plan of agrarian colonization, the crucial territory is Ukraine. If you want to master agricultural production to build industry, from the Soviet point of view, you have to control Ukraine. If you want a breadbasket, which is going to make you economically self-sufficient, from the German point of view, you have to control Ukraine. In other words, very different ideas of how to change the world, quite different ideas of how to change the world, can still focus on the same part of the world, which is the last thing that I wanted to say about ideology in place. Ideology even though we tend to consider it abstractly, has a way of fixing territory in world history. Okay, that's a very grand formulation. What do I mean? I mean this. The Soviets, of course, have a view of the entire world. They believe that there is going to be a world revolution at some point. They believe that it's going to happen at some point. It fails in 1917, but it's going to happen in the future. And in the meantime, you have to, to use one of Stalin's um, more straightforward formulations. You have to colonize from within. In the middle term, you have to modernize yourself from within. The Nazis, Hitler, they also have a view of the world. They believe that there's going to be a war of the continents, that a Germany which makes itself self-sufficient by way of this colonization is going to defeat the British and the Americans and become the greatest superpower in a world of two or three superpowers. They have a vision of the world. But in the middle term, for the time being, what they need to do is conquer Eastern Europe, to make themselves self-sufficient. So you have these different ideologies. They're different in content. You have these different views of time. You have these different views of economics. And you have different views of the future of the world. But in both cases, it leads down to a focus on precisely the same lands, the lands between. Now, <coughs> if you get all of this if this makes sense, then the rest of the book, in some sense, then just becomes the details. Because if you know that the two regimes, um, ideologically, economically, in terms of their views of time, in terms of their views of the future, are concentrating on these lands, then it's not surprising, so to speak, or it won't be surprising that so much of the killing happens between Moscow and Berlin. You can, you can suspect, you would suspect, if you, if you follow this argument, if you believe this argument, that the two regimes would sometimes interact. After all, if they're both concerned with the same territories, they, may, they might make peace about these territories, they might make war over these territories, and of course both of those things do happen. They make, they make peace in 1939, they make war in 1941. And you can even anticipate where they can make peace and where they will make war. They can make peace about Poland. They can ally with each other in order to destroy Poland, as they do in 1939. Because from the point of view of both of these worldviews, from the point of view of both of these plans, the independent Polish state is nothing but a kind of awkward barrier. It's just a problem. It's something which really shouldn't exist. It's just in the way. They can agree about that. In fact, they do agree about that. Where they absolutely cannot agree is over Ukraine. And it's over Ukraine that they have to fight. And it's over Ukraine that they do fight in 1941. So that is an account of the book which isn't in the book, which gives you a sense of why the things which happen in the book are perhaps not as surprising or shocking as they might seem at first glance. What I try to do in the book itself is give tight, clear presentations of each of the policies of mass killing as they fall down upon the peoples of these territories. Basically, you can break it down into three periods. The first period from 1933 to 1938 the Soviets are doing almost all of the killing, and it's almost all inside the Soviet Union. In the second period from 1939 to 1941, 
the, the scale of killing is about the same. The two states have allied, they've divided up Eastern Europe between them, and they're killing on roughly the same scale, tens of thousands, low hundreds of thousands. In the third period from 1941 to 1945, the Germans have invaded the Soviet Union, and now almost all of the killing is being done by the Germans. The first chapter concerns this famine with which I began, where Stalin, as his policy of collectivizing agriculture, as his policy of taking farmland and putting it under control of the state, seems to fail, blames internal enemies, the most prominent of which is the Ukrainian nation, and then sees to it by way of some very clear and, and, uh, and precise policies that some people pay for the failure of his own policy rather than others. Those people are, as I say, the inhabitants of Soviet Ukraine. About three million of them die. Not because they have to die, food is being exported at the time, but because they're punished for not making requisitions targets. They're, the, the grain is extracted from Soviet Ukraine and taken to other places. Individuals are targeted, communities are targeted, collective farms are targeted. If you didn't make your, your requisitions um, quota, your livestock would be taken away. Now that, to most of you, but probably not all of you, that seems like a very trivial thing. Um, for farmers, livestock is the very last thing between you and starvation. You, you, you milk that goat, or as a last resort, you, you kill it, slaughter it. When the Soviets took, took meat away, they were intentionally doing people. If a village didn't make its target, that village would be placed on something called a blacklist, which meant that it wasn't allowed to trade with the rest of the Soviet Union. Nothing could go in or nothing could go out which was also a death sentence. The entire republic of Soviet Ukraine um, was sealed so that people could not go begging from Soviet Ukraine anywhere else. Not only mean to Poland and neighboring countries, I mean to other parts of the Soviet Union. The rationale for that was that people were spreading bad propaganda with their bloated bellies. The next couple of chapters, two and three, concern the Great Terror of the Soviet Union. When we think of the Great Terror, we traditionally imagine purges of army officers